I don't know if talent can be genetically transmitted, but it's clearly part of this family's DNA. Susan Rosenberg Jones is an accomplished photographer whose work has appeared in galleries and museums all over the US and all over the world. Her daughter, Rebecca Naomi Jones, is a star of Broadway, off-Broadway, television, and even car commercials. <laughs> She made her Broadway debut in her 20s as a star of Passing Strange. And this week is the premiere of Genius Aretha, where Rebecca plays Aretha Franklin's sister. To me, I saw this headline in the New York Times from, I think, a year ago that said it all. An intoxicating singer, whether it's Green Day or Oklahoma. So glad to have Susan and Rebecca with us today. And so... Hi. 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 Hi, hi. So here they are, they're mother and daughter, but their careers sort of blossomed at different times of their lives. I'd like each of you, and you can decide who goes first, mother or daughter, to tell me about an important first moment for you, the role, the exhibition that made you feel like, wow, I'm on my way. Mom, go for it. Uh, first, um, I guess, well, there were probably moments before, but the one that stands out right now is the um, solo show I had at the Griffin Museum of Photography, and that was in October of 2019. And it's a body of work that means a lot to me. And um, I was really grateful that the curator uh, saw something in the work and um, decided to show several images from it. And I got a chance to, uh, I got to go to the, the Griffin at, for the opening and um, speak to the people who were there and talk about the work. And the feedback was really wonderful that I received. And I guess I felt really good about it. What was this, what was the subject of the exhibition? The subject uh, is, well, at the time I called the body of work widow slash ER, but now I just call it widowed. And it's people who have lost their longtime partners. I, I love those photographs and I highly recommend everybody to go to Susan's website and look at them. Um, and we're gonna talk more about those particular photos a little bit later in the interview. Um, uh, but right now, I want to hear, Rebecca, what was the aha moment for you? Was it the Village Temple Children's Choir, or did it come along later? <laughs> it, was, it was clearly the Village Temple Children's Choir. End of story. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think, I mean, you know, I did, I did grow up singing and, and doing theater in school, and then I went to school for, you know, a, a very specific um, conservatory training, but I will say the turning point for me was um, was opening night um, of Passing Strange on Broadway because, um, I mean, it was so already so exciting. It was such a milestone, um, but I remember um, one of the Broadway press people um, who are like the same people you see all the time, which is so wonderful. Um, I remember one of those press people interviewing me on the red carpet and saying, well, you know, now you've crossed over, you are a Broadway actor. Like it's, it's just happened now, it just happens just like that. And so, and that really stuck with me, you know, it was all those years ago, but I remember just being like, oh, wow, I'm a Broadway actor suddenly, you know? So, um, so yeah, that was, um, I must've been 27, younger, 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 younger. Yeah, yeah. Wow, amazing. Yeah. So there have been so many stories written about how the pandemic has affected artists. Theaters shut down, galleries shut down for much of the year, museums shut down. So what has this year been like for each of you? Uh, the, I know we only have 45 minutes, so maybe <laughs> let's, let's keep it too artistically for right now. Okay. Well, mom, I feel like, I feel like mom's had like a really fruitful year. I, yes. mean, I feel like it's actually been really interesting for your art. It's been a very say? interesting year for me. Yeah. I, um, the pandemic, I, you know, yeah, it's tough to be, I mean, I miss my friends and uh, going out and, um, 
all the usual things and especially going to gallery openings and lectures and meeting with friends. But um, I, you know, I do like being home and a lot of my work centers on, on home and family and community. Well, I couldn't work with the community um, photography, but I certainly was um, inspired around my house just to look at everything very with a lot of attention. And um, for the first several months of the pandemic, I photographed Joel, my husband, um, around the house just every dayness of the pandemic, whether it's doing on the mat, doing a Zoom uh, yoga class or um, a lot of cooking, um, endless. It was like uh, the horrible politics of seeing it on the television and photographing, you know, just being on the couch watching and all that kind of stuff. So for the first several months, I, um, and then I, I, I photographed just us being together. I just the feeling of how it felt just two people in the house. It's only a two bedroom apartment. You know, there's not that much place to go, but um, just, just kind of expressing the feeling of being um, isolated like that with thankfully somebody who, you know, we can, I can get, a, we can get along really well. That's what we discovered. So that was good. We get along really well, just being isolated for months on end. And then I started to, um, I kind of felt badly for Joel that I was, you know, <laughs> you know, always shooting. So I don't know, I just started doing self portraits. I set up the camera on my tripod. I have a remote. I hadn't used it in a long time. And um, I started to explore what it felt like from inside myself and um, all the feelings I was having, all the little obsessions that one kind of gets to explore while you're just by yourself in the house, isolated, like, you know, looking at my neck in the mirror and trying <laughs> to exercise it to make it like not the way it is. And, you know, just stuff like that or laying in the bed, like reading constantly. I mean, it's good that I did so much reading or I still do, but just sort of always reading. You know, so those kind of things. And then, you know, Michelle Obama had talked about the just sort of the mild depression. This was especially before the election, you know, it was just awful. So just photographed myself laying in bed just in the middle of the day. So um, that was really helpful and I'm still doing it. Amazing. Again, I highly urge everybody to go to Susan Rosenberg Jones com because the, the work is quite extraordinary. It sure um, is. And so, Rebecca, what about you? I mean, I, I, I've seen some of the things you've done. I know you did some performances online, but tell me, I know you've actually had a weirdly busy year. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, it's certainly not as busy as usual. Um, you know, theater is just a non-event. Um, but, you know, people have gotten so creative. Um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I um, was a part of a musical that was recorded as a podcast. So that was really fun. I got to um, do some really theatrical voiceover work, um, which, was, which was really exciting um, and very timely. And then, um, and then actually this past week, I recorded a play on tape for Audible, which will come out in June, which was really, really fun. It was just a brief four day recording session. But um, but again, like I got to do a really fun character and vocal performance and exploration. And, um, and it was just so nice to be connected to people in some way, you know? Um, yeah, so artistically it's, you know, it's been a lot of, uh, it's been much less busy in general than usual. I mean, I did, um, in September, we re-picked up uh, our shooting of Genius Aretha, which we had um, suspended in March due to the pandemic. So I did get a couple of months of, um, of onset uh, action, which was really interesting with masks and PPE and uh, you know all of the protocol. Um, really, really wild. But of course it was actually uh, wonderful because everybody was so happy to be back at work um, that actually it was, it was um, <laughs> I would say it was a, a more fulfilling experience than being on set at, at, you know, for this show uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, 
but yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. And actually I think it's been good for me to have a little break from theater and, and um, you know, just think about what I want and that sort of thing. And now I've been really, really busy with um, auditions for TV and film, just because it, it is actually technically pilot season. And so it's like multiple auditions a week. And my boyfriend is um, really great at directing me and reading with me. So um, unfortunately he gets the task of uh, helping with all of that constantly. <laughs> he, did, he did a great Irma Franklin. She he did that. actually. He he was uh -huh. part of my audition process for Genius Aretha. <laughs> That's great. And yeah. you you guys are in LA now. Yeah, we're in LA now, but we'll be back in New York in a month. Good. No one yeah. to be too too tied to the West Coast. So no, no, we'll try not to. Yeah, it'll be good for me too. To see yeah, you. I know. I know. <laughs> Can't wait to see you. So. I'd like to talk to you both a bit about Eddie Jones, Susan's late husband and Rebecca's dad. He was a composer and a singer in the early days of rock and roll, and he later became a beloved coach to, to many groups. Um, so I was wondering, I, I guess I'm going to start with Susan on this one. How did you meet and decide to get married? And what was that like then? I mean, you were Jewish and white, and he was black, and... What was, yeah. what, how did your families react? How did the world react? Well, we met in the 70s. Um, I had moved to New York and I was going to go to um, SVA uh, for photography. I'd already had my college degree and all that. Um, so I was going to just take in some continuing education in photography. And um, I had a summer that I, where I didn't have, um, I think I came there, I came to New York early summer and I kind of had a couple of months off until, until I had to start September. And um, I had a friend from college who was now in New York working as an actor and singer. And um, Eddie had been hired to um, coach her and a couple of guys into becoming kind of a jazz vocal group. And so um, she said to me, oh, you've got to meet this Eddie Jones. He's so great. And these rehearsals are really fun. So I had nothing else to do. And I love jazz. And so I went and um, I started going to rehearsals with them. And then, you know, he would teach and they would sing, which was a lot of fun. And then we would go out and go to Central Park and walk around and get something to eat. And so I just, just got to know him that way. And then we started to um, realize that we liked each other. So then in um, January of 77, we decided to move in to live together and we found a cute little place in Chelsea on 22nd Street. And um, my parents were gonna come into, into New York and I hadn't said anything to them. They knew I had a boyfriend. So we go and we sit down at the Angry Squire, which no longer exists. It was sort of a, um, a jazz, you know, it, it was a restaurant that would have jazz act. It was a nice place. Too bad it's gone. But anyway, we sat at a booth and um, my parents, I could tell they were kind of surprised. And, but Eddie was so good. You know, I came from, I don't know, I grew up, like I was born in 1951. And I think it was sort of a parental style, a parenting style at that time where you don't really talk much about emotions or feelings because mm -hmm. I thought it was just my, you know, dysfunctional family, but apparently that was, that's very common at that time. So, um, but Eddie just came out and just said, I know I'm not what you would want for your daughter or what you're expecting, but we really love each other very much. And I don't know, he just went on and talked about feeling and they were so thrilled, they like relaxed. And mm -hmm. from that moment, they just liked him. I mean, they loved him. And when Rebecca was born, forget it, you know, they, they were crazy about her. So that all worked out as for, um, well, it was the 70s and we were in New York and the circles we were in were artsy circles or music circles. So we didn't really get a lot of prejudice, prejudice or problems per se. I mean, there were moments like when I'll never forget when I took, we took Rebecca home from the hospital, the cab driver didn't like what was happening. So he, I mean, we almost like, we had to like, Eddie had to say, please stop the car, we're getting out. Uh, we got out in some like overpass. We just had to get out of there because mm. I thought the guy was gonna like kill us. And she was just a little tiny newborn. It was sick, it was scary. But 
Um, no, it, it, everything was a lot easier than you'd imagine. Hmm. Uh, thankfully, you know, New York City and, you know, downtown, it was just a different atmosphere. And then, you know, Rebecca started at the Village Temple and um, we were welcomed there as a family. And, uh, you know, I, I told Liat that I was going to shout out to the Village Temple. So there you go. <laughs> I had to bring it in to the convo. Well, um, so that that's that's a great story. I I'd never actually heard it, and I guess I wanted to ask um, both of you, but I'm going to toss this one to Rebecca first. So you have these two major streams of identity flowing into your family. You know, you've got the Jewish and the Black, and you know. So was that ultimately an abundance of? excitement and thrill and history or an abundance of woe. I think you've got the Jews, the Blacks, and I think. Yeah. Um, so what was that like for you, Rebecca? Um, you know, it's been such an interesting journey. I think as a kid, I recognized early on that it was cool and interesting. And so I think I kind of like worked it a little bit, you know, like it depending on what company I was in. Um, I would like make sure people knew that I was mixed and from these backgrounds. And, you know, I think that's for a complicated reason. I think, you know, a lot of it, I'm realizing really only in the last couple of years that a lot of it was my uh, attempt to make other people comfortable. Um, like if that's by letting other, Jewish people know that I'm Jewish or letting other white people know that I'm half white or, you know, like all of the ways that we can try to make people um, other us less, I guess, um, or just include you in their tribe, uh, you know, um, it's really, it's just so interesting because, um, you know, a lot of times I just have, I've grown up with people not knowing different parts of my identity. And so I've heard people say things to me that I don't necessarily want to hear or that they don't realize that I'm part of the thing that they're saying something about. Or, um, you know, I've also had people just come up to me and immediately just be like, girl, blah, 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 blah. They just assume they know so much about me based on how I look. And, uh, and I think I just spent a lot of years um, just trying to like work my identity for other people's comfort and ultimately for my own um, sense of fitting in. But, um, but you know, as I've, as I've got, gotten older, it's just become even more of something I'm so proud of. I mean, we're, we're, we're really complicated people on both sides and we've been through a lot. <laughs> um, so, you know, I love it. And especially, you know, as an actor and, and singer, what I do is so much about, um, about relating to people. And I love that I just, I have so much rich history to draw from. And, um, but yeah, I was, I think I was lucky to grow up in New York. Uh, you know, it, it took a while before I realized that um, what I, what I was could be like incredibly weird to someone, you know? Like I, I think when I grew up, I knew it was cool in New York to be half black and half Jewish. Um, but then it was like, when I got to college in North Carolina was where people were like, huh? <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, it's, it's been a trip. Was it's that, was that huh, a negative huh or was it a positive huh? Both. I definitely, mostly it was a positive huh because I was at a very artsy conservatory. Um, but there were, there were some, you know, it was, a, it was a school that a lot of people from that part of the country went to. So even still, you know, artists will surprise you sometimes. They're not always super left um, liberals, you know? Sometimes people, people have deep-seated feelings, <laughs> um, to say the least. So, so um, yeah, I definitely had some people be like, How, how's that? Like, how'd that work out? And just complicated feelings about it, but... Um, you know, it was, um, especially at that time, I was so 
uh, I felt like I was like the right person for those kinds of people because I was like, well, I can make anybody feel comfortable and that's going to be my job. And I'm going to be the representative of mixed people and people of color for you who's never had never met a Jewish person and probably, you know, only met a few black people and you've, you've already had some idea of who they were and never got to know them. So, you know, for a long time, I felt like it was like, I'm the leader of the <laughs> <laughs> the getting to know you fun so um yeah. it's a lot it's a lot of it's a lot to carry on those little shoulders there. it is it is but i was equipped for it like i just i think i just naturally um went in that direction for a long time but this year has been really interesting i mean it's been it's been very healthy to sort of have the realization of all of this yeah, I was wondering if both of you could talk a little bit. I mean, I thought about it a lot before I was, when I was getting ready for today. And, you know, with this year, with the Black Lives Matter movement coming so much to the forefront and, you know, issues of identity becoming so, you know, things that you should be proud of, but also have been used as weapons in, yeah. in a way against people. And I wondered, like, you know, and yet, you know, knowing your family and knowing the relationship between you and your mom, which is so incredible. And also just looking at you and, you know, there's your mother right there on your face. Oh, yeah. You know, like, very funny how much you look like her. I mean, you know, and um, mm -hmm. but I wonder, Susan, if you could chime in too, A, if, if this year has caused the two of you to have any additional conversations about these issues. And and did you talk about this when, uh, or like, you know, I guess this is also for S Susan a little bit, like did you and Eddie have talks about how you were gonna do this or did it just happen organically? Like, oh, this is our daughter we're raising or this is who we are. Like, how did, how did that happen? Well, you know, as it was kind of thing that you learn as you go and you do as you keep going. And um, we chose very carefully um, where to live, we had to send her to school um, and, uh, you know, we, we hit it, I think, pretty well the whole time. Um, she was always very welcome. Uh, and the Village Temple even, you know, I had checked out several synagogues to make sure that this was the right one. Um, and as she grew, uh, you know, we were always there in case there was a, a for anything for her to talk about. But we, um, we really trusted her, even when you know, she was a teenager, to um, know how to take care of herself. Uh, but you know, we were, I think we were always there for her. We, you know, I'm, I'm sure we had some talks, um, but I don't really, nothing really stands out um, yeah. as being a big problem. Well, that's probably why it wasn't. Right, <laughs> you know? yeah. I think that's probably, you know, I mean, I've thought about this too, Rebecca, and sort of the roles that, you know, that Rebecca's played. It's kind of amazing, you know, Yitzhak, the Jewish Red Queen, and, and Laurie, who, you know, in the past has been, you know, Shirley Jones, you know, about as, as non-Jewish, non-Black a person as you could be, and yet she just <laughs> right into that role just so effortlessly you know it's incredible and I think that's been that's really a gift that's a gift that you've given that the two of you have given really to our world to see oh yeah there's a there's a way to not even talk about this but just be it you know which totally is, exactly um yeah. I also wanted to ask you like with um the whole issue in New York, of course, of stage parent of stage parents, and here you come from a dad who's a coach. Did he was he very involved in your um, training? In your did he coach you? Did he? You know, he he didn't coach me per se, but when I was younger, I'd say up until, gosh, up until what, mom? Uh, through high school. I would say up until, up until college, my dad definitely always wanted to like do stuff together, collaborate. I mean, we certainly right. did. There, there were like um, there dance was, concerts at, at my high school and, um, and middle school too, where like my dad played the piano, my dad accompanied me and I sang. 
Uh, we did that a couple of times. We have videos somewhere. He was so um, proud. He was, so, he proud. was so, so proud. And he also like, if I was rehearsing something or um, practicing something for an audition, he always wanted to like jump in and coach. Um, but I was really resistant to it for a long time. I don't know if you remember well, I would be like, I do. Like, oof. Especially because I just, I was at a certain point, I was veering into more of like a, um, you know, an acting through song arena. And my father he just came from a world where it's like, if you say the word you, you point to the person, you know, it was like very like, and I, this, and you. And I was like, that's <laughs> not it dad <laughs> um but so yeah I mean there were definitely many many years especially as a young kid where um like my dad arranged harmonies with me and um my other musical friends like I have one of my best girlfriends Alana da Fonseca who actually went to um she she her she and her mom were parts of the were members of the temple for a, for a while and I we were, we became best friends when we were 11 and she's still my best friend um but she she is super musical. She's music she's a music, musician now, and I remember she remembers my dad like with us at the piano, coaching us to do harmonies, and so we did a lot of that as a kid. Like you know, har like harmonies with friends who were musical, doing like girl group stuff. Um, but he he was never like my real coach because I just would not let him be. <laughs> I also remember like there was a long period of time where he would um, use a studio. Midtown uh, rehearsal yep. studio to rehearse his, his uh, groups or single singers. But eventually that studio started to follow hard times and I think they have closed at some point. So he's just started, you know, we have a piano in the house so he started coaching in the house. And when she was little, you know, I mean, she soaked it all up. And some of the, some of the students he had were not always on key. And um, I remember giving her a bath when she was little, like about four. And he's in the other room, like, you know, yelling at the person, no, it's ah. And Rebecca starts, ah, you know, like, <laughs> she had exactly, I mean, and I said, this, you know, it was really cute. I, and that's how it was for years. Yeah, that's it is how it was for years. Like yeah. just hearing the harmonies and knowing that's not exactly it. <laughs> Wow, that is so great. So, um, you know, I know uh, when Eddie died in 2008, I, for me, Susan, that was the moment in retrospect that your, that your photography, that your art really took off in, a, in, in, in the professional world, because I think that's, not, after that was when you started the Widow, the Widow, Widower series. Well, actually, the Widow Widower series, um, I didn't start till later, but after um, he passed away in August of 2008 and um, starting in 2009, I picked up my camera, you know, and I said, I want to get, you know, serious again because I had sort of been in caretaker mode for a few years and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really, I was, wasn't photographing as much. So I started to, um, you know, get back into it. And I did, I started off doing a lot of portraiture and um, and then I, I was taking some critique classes at, at International Center of Photography in the evenings just to kind of get back into it. And I, I love, you know, there's nothing I love more than looking at photographs and talking about them and whether it's mine or somebody else's. And so that was a lot of, it was great. I met some friends who were still friends uh, in the photography community. And so I started working on different projects and um, I didn't get to Widowed until uh, 2018, actually. Oh, oh, oh. I did other things before that. I see, because I know you did all the pictures of the people in your building. I mean, all of Yeah, that. building one, um, that, that, yeah, that I, I did for two or three or four years. That was great. And then, um, I mean, I really enjoyed it um, and I got to, you know, you just get to so, go into someone's house and, and meet them and kind of collaborate with them in a portrait. And I really enjoyed that. And then um, I got more intimate with my portraiture and photographed Joel, who's my, my husband now. And um, that, you know, I'm still doing that really, but um, that was a real gratifying 
a body of work, especially because I, I still to this day get emails from strangers who aren't even photographers who've seen the work and they say, oh, I, you know, how much they like it and they, re they relate to it in some way. Or, um, but then after that, I, I started to think about doing this project with widows because, because after Eddie died, I was only in my late fifties and none of my friends, everybody was alive and well. Nobody really had that experience. And um, I wanted to talk about it and sort of grasp what was happening, you know, how it was gonna change my life and, you know, what just happened and, you know, the whole thing. And um, I looked for books that would help. And there's, you know, the usual like Joan Didion and uh, books, but nothing really was that helpful. And I said, so when I decided to do the Widow Project, I, I I wanted to do something that I would have found helpful. Mm -hmm. So I started to photograph women and men who had lost their partner. And um, I interviewed them and, and they, you know, I pulled some of the verbatim uh, statements from them and, and they put, I put it with the picture. So, you know, and every, I try to, you know, everybody has something different to say. So I think it's helpful to people who have lost their partner or whose partner is very sick. Um, but that was like the intent. Well, and the photographs are incredible. I mean, I've, I try to describe your photographs to people. I mean, you really have to look at them because in some ways they're incredibly blunt. I mean, you show the wrinkles under people's necks and you don't pretty prettify people, but they're so real and so empathic and they really feel like you're seeing inside of people's feelings it's they're without being at all sentimental they're really incredible um I just I I'm so over, overwhelmed and impressed with the work you've done thank um, you so much and and Rebecca you know I was thinking 2008 so you were quite young when your dad died and it feels like ironically it's the same time your career was really taking off yeah and I, and I, and I wonder what was that like for you, you know, to incorporate this grief, I guess, into your work, because you don't come off as a sad, you know, depressed person at all. But how did how did that affect you at the time? What were you working on? And how did you deal with it? Well, um, you're absolutely right. It was a it was like just the beginning of when I started to get really busy. Um, Passing Strange on Broadway closed. Um, Where that? No, no, I know. Passing Strange on Broadway closed um, in July of 2008. And my father passed away a month later. Right. And, um, and simultaneously, I had just started like days, days before rehearsal for this amazing Terrell McCraney play called Wig Out that was going to be at um, at the Vineyard. Um, and it's such a great, joyous, colorful play. And, um, and, you know, here I was at this place where I was like, oh my gosh, my career is just really like starting to pop off, like things are starting to be really consistent. And so, and also I just have this part, this, this part of myself that I still have, which is like this desire to like not let people down and to be all things to all people at all times. And so I was just like, you know, it was Tina Land I was directing. She's so amazing. And she was like, you know, take time off. And I was like, no, I, I don't want to, you know, mess anybody up and blah, blah, blah. But it's, it's so much also about just like wanting to be thought of as like a good student. You know, it's not really about trying to give anybody what they need because probably it would have been fun. Um, but um, I kept working and, uh, you know, I would take times to cry a lot. Um, and at a certain point we got to, we got through all of the main rehearsal, bulk of the rehearsal process. And then we got to, um, we were, we were finally at the theater and we were um, getting ready to do run throughs and stuff. And um, we did in fact wear wigs in this show called Wig Out. And I remember I was doing my wig prep, which means like taking bits of my hair and braiding it and putting it in little tiny pin curls and whatever so that you can, somebody can plop a 
wig on top. And I remember a cast member, castmate of mine said, Rebecca, do you know that you have a bald spot at the back of your head? And so um, at the time it was about a quarter size and, um, you know, I did all of the things and it was, it was grief induced alopecia. And it was my body telling me that I needed to really um, sit down <laughs> and, and just be with the grief a little more. Um, and then it, it just got worse before it got better. I mean, it, it became like this big and it, it recurred for the next couple of years at the same time of the year. Even I remember when we were doing the first workshop of uh, what became American Idiot, what was at the time called the um, Untitled Punk Rock Musical, I had this huge bald spot in the back of all this hair. And I remember like, I had to do all this head banging and thrashing around in this workshop. And I had to like, you know, it was so stressful. Just like I had to pin my hair just so, so that like people wouldn't see it. It was, you know, it's like, it's a nightmare. Just, you know, all of the stuff that my hair is such a part of my identity and all of that. So yeah, I was, I was working and it was crazy. And, um, and it definitely like, upended my um, current, my relationship that I was in at the time. And it, um, yeah, it was a really interesting trip sort of keeping on the path of um, building my career and, and dealing with the grief. But you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's also been hard because the older I get and the more um, I become who I am as an artist, the more I feel close to him and like I understand him. Uh, and I just wish I could talk to him. And you know what I say whenever Rebecca's on, Rebecca, whenever you're on stage, there are moments when I see him in you like so strongly. And it's, it's just so emotional. Yeah. Like face, when you're seeing, when you're belting something out or I see it and it's, yeah. ah, he's, he's feeling her now, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Crazy. following up on this, somebody had asked in the chat, I just saw it, if um, you could talk a little bit about Eddie's family and if you guys all stay close and... Yes, we're still, we're still close. Rebecca just saw her Aunt Betty. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, yeah, she lives in Atlanta. So when I was there for Genius, finally, it took me so long, but finally I saw her right before I left. It was so great to see her. Oh, that's great. Yeah, we definitely stay close to them. They're wonderful. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so this is probably not a polite question, but I have to ask it. So, um, so Susan, I follow you on Facebook and I look for your photos and often they're pictures of Joel, your current husband. <laughs> he's always naked. Joel never wears clothes. He loves, he loves and, to, yeah, he's comfortable. And Rebecca, actually, I think was it Big Love in one of your plays, all of a sudden you're taking your clothes off and I thought, oh, what? Yeah family you're always getting naked so, <laughs> so I need to know what's that about <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny and true funny. well you know I just think it's a cute it's Joel's like, so adorable and um he's so, his quirks <laughs> are so fun and you know he's just comfortable when he comes home and he just done you know takes off his clothes and it's comfortable and you know, often he just has his socks on, which um, people just really like, because he always wears like kind of colorful socks. And um, and sometimes an apron. And sometimes an apron because he loves to cook. So, um, and or he'll sit and, you know, he's very, like he's an artist himself and he, he makes these little trees and and um, he'll just, you know, I'll photograph him while he's making the trees, but it's, he's not wearing anything. And I don't know, it's like lovable and delightful. And Rebecca had to be naked in that show, I remember. And she yeah. had a lot of trepidation. And I had to go back to when I said, look, I went to Woodstock and people just, it's, nobody thought about it, you know. Yeah. And I tried to like talk her into looking at it in a different way. So she yeah. passed it, which it's, is what it did. Did it's, it work? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who has a lot of body-ish um so so it definitely was a trip but I was also like excited to force myself out of that you know if possible which was you know sort of yeah 
Because it's happens. a little bit different from Woodstock. First of all, probably everybody isn't stoned in the audience, and you're up on the stage. It's not every. No, it's yep. a little different atmosphere. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yep. I definitely didn't tell everybody ahead of time that this is what was going to happen. So I've I had some friends be like, uh, "Could you have warned me?" Uh, and it was so funny because when uh, the time when my brother and sister in law came to the show, my brother had to put his head down. You know. She, I definitely uh, remember thinking, "Well." Good thing dad's not here for this. <laughs> and and when she was an American idiot, she had a prance around in like like underwear, like scantily clad. Yeah. And um, I remember um, Eddie's brother came to see the show one time, and he had to go like this. <laughs> she yep. <was> doing that. <laughs> yeah. That's what I do for my family. <laughs> So listen, you guys, we just have a few minutes left. I'm so sad. I'm really enjoying this so much. This was great. Please, Rebecca, even I have a little jingle. No, Rebecca wait, wait, and wait, Susan. Before we, go, before we go, I need both of you. This is your promo spot. So you got to tell people Ooh. what's up next. What do you want people to, to look out for in your work? Okay. Who's first? Me? Mom? Oh. Yeah, go for it. Okay, I had to write it down. Okay, so um, Soho Photo in, um, on White Street um, is gonna have an actual physical show of um, a, group, a group exhibit. Um, it's the, um, what was it? The 2020 National Competition Winners. And it's a really nice show. It uh, was curated by Chris Graves. It's, it's a beautifully curated show and, and uh, he's gonna go in himself and sequence all the images on the wall. So, um, you have to like, I think you have to go onto Soho Photo website and make sure that, you know, I think you have to sort of make an appointment because they don't want obviously too many people in at once, but it's a huge space. So um, they can handle a few people. And it's up now? It. It's up now? No, I'm sorry. March 26th to April 18th. Um, and then in, um, I think around April 24th, <laughs> this is really crazy. Um, I'm going to be, I have a show of building one, those photos of um, the community on, you know, Independence Plaza um, in Russia. Get it. Nizhny Tagil in the Urals, Russia. <laughs> it's going to be on Karl Marx Street. Oh. I mean, it's, you know, and um, I'm very thrilled about it because the, the, the guy couldn't be nicer, the, the curator who, who runs the gallery. He's a young, um, he's an artist himself and he found me, uh, I don't know, I guess I was on a, a F-Stop magazine feature at, at one point and he was, he found me on there and he said, I really like your work. And so that happened. Um, and then, um, let's see what, oh, the Yellow Rose Project. I was um, really thrilled to be invited. Um, There's a hundred women who, photographers who were, had been invited to show, um, to be part of the Yellow Rose Project, which was commemorating the 19th Amendment. And um, the exhibit started online on um, last August 18th. And I guess it's going for the year. And so the work has been exhibited around the country in different places. And um, it's really, I mean, the whole show is really wonderful. So um, I was really glad. When it's up in the, and how to find it's up in the chat for anybody who wants yeah. to. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll put the, the uh, link. Yeah, just, and, and also just remember SusanRosenbergJones.com. You can yeah, that's it. easy to remember. And okay. then, uh, yeah, the only other thing I think I'm going to be, I'm going to be on a show, a, a group show called Internal Dialogue, where they had asked photographers to um, photograph, well, to, to show photography about living in the, through the pandemic. Wow. So internal dialogue. So there are a lot of very insightful, thoughtful, sensitive images by, I guess they're going to show 24 photographers and that's in Orleans, Mass. I don't know the date yet. I guess it'll be late summer, fall, but it's a gallery there. So that's Thank the list. You. That is wonderful. And, and Rebecca, tell us. Um, my list is shorter, but um, I have um, Genius Aretha, the um, mini series about Aretha Franklin. Um, it's an eight episode mini series. Uh, it is going to premiere this Sunday, March 21st. Um, and I believe what they're doing is two episodes a night for four nights consecutively. And then um, starting on the 25th, which is Aretha's birthday, all of the episodes will be available, I think on Hulu, but Ooh. it's... Okay. Yes, um, but yes, it's Nat Geo, um, so I think it'll be on Disney Plus. Um, <clears throat> so that will be starting the twenty first, and then yeah, I do have a um, 
audible play um, that I'm that I read a role in um, that will come out I think in June, but that will that will be uh, TBA on that. And I think that's the only stuff I have to announce at this moment. Well, that's yeah. pretty good. That's pretty good for right <laughs> now. Yeah. Well, you guys, you are awesome. This has been so nice. Oh, and one final question. Well, Rebecca, it's not lunchtime in LA, so what'd you have for breakfast? Well, I haven't eaten yet. I um, I had my coffee. I have a little bit of a headache today, so I was just a little like loop-de-loops, but I uh, did have my coffee with my, um, I think I had nut pods, which is like a coconut milk, almond milk combo type situation, unsweetened. Very important to... Uh, let the people know. And then I'm going to probably make myself a smoothie with protein powder, spinach, you know, healthy stuff. Very LA, very good. <laughs> I'm so LA. <laughs> and Susan, what are you having for lunch? Well, I'm so New York because for breakfast, I had I had gone to um, have my hair cut in the Lower East Side. So I went to Russ and Daughters on the way out. And um, so I just, for breakfast, I had some, um, white for salad on a piece of holy toast with some lettuce. So I'm not really that hungry, but I will have a salad, you know, for lunch, I'm sure. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, ladies, well, I look forward to maybe having lunch in one place. That would be nice. It would be lovely. Julie, you're terrific. This was really fun. This was great. Thank you so much, Julie. You guys make it so easy. Let's see. And thank you to the AJHS. <laughs> Bye. And Becca Miller is, is great. Yes. Thank you all. Rebecca Miller. Thank you. Bye. Yes. Bye. Thank you, Rebecca Miller. Thank you for coming. Thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.